Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to RAMP's first gen graduate student panel. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Valerie, I love your photo there. <laughs> um, your dog looks really ready to go to grad school and get that information in his hoodie. Uh, so I wanna start by uh, say happy International Women's Day. Um, I think every day should be International Women's Day, but really recognizing that and um, acknowledging that. And I also want to acknowledge that Cal Poly Pomona resides on the traditional territory of the Tongva people. And um, I also wanna acknowledge the people of Ukraine and other refugees who need our continued support. Um, this session will be recorded for those that may be interested in grad school, but were unable to attend this session. And we will uh, be taking a picture for social media at the end. So, um, if you're comfortable turning your camera on at the end, you're welcome to. And we'll also have time for question and answer at the end. So if you um, have any questions for the panelists, you can type it into the chat or you can unmute yourself or you can raise your hand using the chat feature or the Zoom feature. Uh, welcome, my name is Denise Aranda Seville. I am one of the uh, advisors with RAMP. We also have Christian, who's another RAMP advisor, Laura, the RAMP director, and Dustin, the tutor coordinator on the call. And with that, I want to hand it over to our moderator, Esmeralda Velasquez, who is one of the RAMP tutors. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us once again. Uh, my name is Esmeralda Velasquez. I'm a RAMP tutor uh, for a little over three years now, um, and I will be your moderator today. So we'll move on to do uh, some quick introductions with our panelists. Um, so let's start off with Daniela. Um, if you could please share uh, your graduate program and your year or your level. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniela Cruz. I'm currently a first year at um, Azusa Pacific University. I'm currently studying college counseling and student development. Awesome. So Gabriel. Hi everyone. My name is Gabriel Maya. My pronouns are he and his, and I am currently a, um, a second year grad student in the Master's of Science in Higher Education program at Cal State Fullerton. Awesome. We'll move on to Sarah. If you could please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Sara Carrillo, uh, pronouns she, hers, and ella. And I'm actually currently um, uh, an undergrad at Cal Poly Pomona, but I am preparing to um, enter grad school for the next academic year. That's very exciting. And we'll move on to Yadira. Hi, everyone. My name is Yadira Terriquez. I use she, her, ella pronouns. And I'm currently in my second year at Cal State Long Beach and doing my master's in counseling and student development in higher education. Okay, so we are very fortunate to have these four uh, panelists join us today, and we'll get started. So, for the first question, um, I'd like to consider. I'd like for um, this is going to be for Daniela and Sara. I'd like you girls to consider some of your earliest notions of graduate school. So, what are some of the reasons you decided to attend grad school? Were there any specific individuals who helped you make your decision? So, please share with us, Daniela. So my first insight um, for grad school, um, I actually did an internship here at Cal Poly Pomona, uh, there were some scholars, and I was like helping um, students out there, like doing resources, doing advising, and that got me really interested in like doing more advising. And in order to do that, I had to get like my master's degree. So with the help of Dustin, Dustin explained to me about grad school and like giving me more options, like, and I really liked the, like the process of it. So like with the help with the career counselor, um, to help me with the process of the application for grad school. So that made me um, motivate me to go to grad school. Awesome, yes. We are very appreciative of having Dustin in our team. So let's move on to Sada. Thank you. So some of the earliest notions, actually the first time I ever heard PhD was when um, my mom, she would clean houses and one of the homeowners was a he had a, a doctoral degree and um that was my first um I, don't, I guess like time learning about a PhD not that I learned a lot but just like the image I got was of a um a white male and it wasn't until um Mount, at Mount Sac I one of my community college teachers um she was a, a female had a PhD and then when I 
got to CPP, I met the first uh, Latina with a PhD, and that was Lorena. She was, I think, the director of poly transfer. So those were the first times I heard, you know, a PhD. Uh, one of the reasons I decided to attend grad school is it actually um, started because of my son. So I, right after I graduated high school, I didn't know what I wanted to study or do. I felt a lot of pressure to go to college as the oldest of six children. And so I ended up going to, I think it's four to five different community colleges. And I failed almost every class. If I didn't fail, I got a W. And so I thought college wasn't for me. Um, and then I had my son and he was diagnosed with autism. And because of his diagnosis, I found out about nutrition, the effect on the brain. And I became fascinated with it. And I said, I want to be an expert on this. How do I become an expert? So I was like, I'm going to get a PhD. <laughs> I had no idea what that would involve. But um, the people along the way that helped me was definitely ACES, a program from Mount SAC. Um, they were the ones who uh, talked about the McNair Scholars Program for me. And so when I came to CPP, I ended up applying uh, for, for McNair Scholars Program uh, during my third year at uh, Cal Poly Pomona and was accepted and they've helped me so much uh, to prepare for grad school and RAMP. RAMP also has been there uh, with me on my journey to preparing for grad school. Thank you for sharing with us, Sara, and your motivation is very beautiful. Um, I really commend you for doing that and you're almost there, you're a step there. <laughs> So we'll move on to the uh, next question for Gabriel and Yadira. So think back to your first quarter or semester in your graduate program. What stood out to you? If you uh, faced any obstacle during your first quarter or your semester, how did you end up resolving that? So we can start with Gabriel. Hi, thank you for that question. Um, so I think for me, one of the things that I didn't really know um, was like, I guess, expectations of myself being in the grad program. As a first generation stu uh, college student, I think for me, that was the hardest. Um, I didn't really know what to expect or how hard the classes were gonna be. Um, I think for myself, I put a lot of pressure on myself to, to do all the readings and try to manage the workload. Um, and that was kind of hard, especially starting the program in a uh, during the pandemic, just because there wasn't as much community um, so feeling like I was going through that alone, that was really hard, uh, as well as battling like the imposter syndrome. Um, I think for me, one good way to kind of get over that and kind of surpass that was really connecting with cohort mates. Um, I think like one of the things I was kind of like raised with as, as a first generation college student is, you know, I could get through this, um, like I can handle this on my own type of thing. And I don't think that was really possible for me to do during grad school. Um, so I, for me, I had a hard time asking for help, but really um, what helped me is actually cohort mates kind of approached me like saying, hey, do you have a study group? Um, jo joining and connecting with them and kind of really building that community with the program. Um, so I think one good thing to remember is um, don't suffer in silence, reach out to your resources if you have them. Uh, you're not going through this alone, you have cohort mates usually um, if you're going through a program like that. So really just reaching out to resources, talking to your professors. Um, and really they can give you advice and return on how to get through some of the issues you're dealing with. Thank you, Gabriel. Yeah, you pointed out a lot of uh, great information, especially for first-generation students. Um, so Yadira, we can hear from you, please. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think for me, the hardest part about my first semester was just the transition. Um, I think I was coming into grad school with a lot of identities that I was unaware of. Um, I never really considered like being first gen or being the daughter of like immigrant parents as like barriers, but they definitely were like as I persisted through my higher ed journey. Um, I also struggled like when I was in high school and I was also part of the ACES program at Mount SAC. And I think like learning how to ask for help, which is what Gabriel said, was really one of the biggest ways um, that I was able to like connect with my network and kind of build the capital as like I moved. 
So like I learned how to like be more like build my social capital, my navigational capital, like where was I, who was I surrounding myself around? And I really leaned on my cohort mates, but the transition was difficult. Um, I know we're going to touch on imposter syndrome, but I think like that's definitely something that I still carry with myself, like being a first time professional, being a first time grad student, um, all the responsibilities that come with like, you know, my home life and my school life and my work life. So looking back at that first semester, I think the scariest part was feeling like I was ill prepared because of my prior education. And also just the transition of having to juggle all of the expectations, not just from everyone, but like expectations I had on myself. Um, so I really just leaned on my support network, like Gabriel said, I leaned on my cohort mates, uh, people that I knew that could relate to me. And at times, even when you feel like people can't relate to you, there's always someone who can relate to you. Um, so really, it was just talking about my experiences so that I wouldn't feel like I was alone in the process. And that's kind of just what helped me. Yeah, thank you for sharing on that. Uh, so I'd like to follow up on that question by asking you, Yadira, what type of learning and student experience were you seeking from graduate school? Um, do you believe you've received it? And if you've also conducted research, how did you choose your advisor or a faculty member? Yeah, so I think my learning and my student experience, when, when I was an undergrad, I was, I was fascinated with the idea that I was receiving help and resources as at a community college. I think when I was in high school, you know, like I was the girl who, you know, had a 1.8 GPA. And the only reason I raised it is because I couldn't play soccer. You know, like I didn't really have people around me who knew what I was capable of. And I think that I doubted myself in the process. So when it came to graduate school, I was seeking to really foster like my knowledge around working with students like I knew that I needed to work on my counseling skills like I didn't even know that that was a thing right but I was like how can I work with students like how can I connect these students how can I tell them that it gets better right like I was so like I'm gonna go to community college and you know like see what's out there for me and I feel like had I not stepped foot on that campus I, I don't know where I would be right um so I knew that I just wanted to be that for people, like for people who maybe were first gen and had no resources. So obviously like once I was in grad school and I had the language to express myself, um, I knew that I wanted to learn more about counseling skills. I knew that I wanted to improve my interpersonal skills with students. I wanted to learn more about the systems of education and you know the struggles. Um, and I also wanted to become more like culturally competent on the different types of students because I identify you know, as a Latina, cisgender, female, and there's, it's so diverse. Grad school is so diverse. So I really just wanted to learn from the people around me. Um, with research, we do research projects every semester. So I've studied like undocumented students, Asian American students, Black and African American students. So that's the type of, that's the student populations. And that's kind of how I challenge myself to learn more about them. They're very individual. You don't lean much on faculty until you decide to write a thesis, which is kind of what I'm leaning towards right now. That's kind of when you start like working more with faculty, but yeah, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, definitely. That's great insight. Uh, Daniela, can you share with us, please? So for me, definitely from learning from undergrads to be confident in yourself because not having confidence in yourself is just like, doubting yourself a lot because at undergrad like I had to learn to be confident because I was like doubting myself like oh no the college is too hard for me I can't do it so like to the point I want to give up but for that like I need to tell like as being a first gen like learning resources um on your own having the help like there like ramp has helped me so much during my undergrad experience like if it wasn't for ramp I wouldn't be where I am right now because they have been helping me so much and like for me right now I'm doing like um acting acting a coach act um advising with students so at my GA so I work with students who has a disability so I know they face a lot of barriers and stigma so I help them out so much and I always tell them like don't doubt yourself like continue thinking so right now I did like um a presentation on couple of students students so of students who works in the farm field so we presented to um a liberal studies uh, classroom me and my partner and right now, during uh, November, we're going to present it to NASPA um, at an Anaheim um, Student Affair. So I'm excited about that. 
That is very exciting. We are very proud of you here at RAMP, Daniela. Um, very awesome stuff. So I'd like to move on to the next question. Um, and it's a lengthy one, but I, it's really informational. And I know a lot of us students always, uh, myself included, it's always the debate, should I enter into grad school directly after uh, finishing my bachelor's or should I give it some time? So we can start out with Sarah. Um, I'd like to ask you, so did you attend grad school directly after completed your undergrad, undergraduate degree? Why or why not? And looking back, would you make the same decision now? What would you recommend students to do uh, to make for themselves more marketable, more marketable to grad um, school admission offers? Okay, so um, I'm still not at uh, grad school yet, but I am preparing. I applied for grad school uh, November, December, and I found out last month that one of the programs I applied to, I've been accepted to do. I'm still waiting on the others. I'm hoping this month I'll find out. But the reason I decided to attend grad school directly after my bachelor's is because I, I know that's where I want to go. And I love research. And I, um, I just, I'm very clear about what I want to what I want to do I don't there's nothing like in between undergrad and grad school that I that I want to do um and also because of time I guess to be very honest um, I'm, I'm a very I'm a parenting student I have a son and I feel like okay I know what I want to do um and I'm like in my 30s like I want to get my PhD um as soon as possible so why not just go for it and so um Sorry, I need to scroll back to see the question. Uh, so yeah, so if you know what you want to do, you can go for it. <laughs> so that's why. Uh, looking back, would I make the same decision now? Well, I'm not there yet. <laughs> so uh, I guess next year I can I can share a little bit more about that. Uh, but what would I recommend students do to make themselves more marketable? I remember my first semester um, that I transferred here to CPP. I attended this diversity conference in San Diego I think it was through the EOP and I asked everyone like what can I do to be uh, to stand out more and the number one answer was research and so I um, because I'm, I'm a parenting student I didn't have that much time um, and I also didn't know how do I how to get started into research so it wasn't until the pandemic that some things happened and it kind of made me like kind of forced me to like okay I need to find, figure out a way to get involved in research and I reached out to the department of nutrition and because that's the department I'm, I'm in and I just asked professors are there any research opportunities and yes I got hired as a research assistant and then through the McNair scholars program I've been doing my own research study um, I discovered the I learned about the project's hatchery program that provides between four thousand to eight thousand dollars in um in students' research. And um, so, yeah, I was able to fund my research study and that's really helped me to stand out in my um, application, my grad school applications. Thank you for sharing with us, Sarah. Uh, let's hear from Gabriel. Hello, thank you. I think, um, so for me, my situation was a little bit different. Um, I did have a, I was a fall graduate, so I graduated fall of 2019. Um, so during my last semester, I was applying to colleges um, to, to graduate program. Um, so when I did graduate, I did have that semester off um, right before the pandemic when it was about to start. Um, I think for me, looking back, would I have made the same decision now? I think, um, like I said, for me, it was a little bit of a special circumstance. Um, I got accepted to the program and then the pandemic happened. So I did think about deferring um, just because I didn't know about the online component. Um, but for me, I also thought like, is this really the job market I would like to be in? So those are some of the factors that kind of went into my decision. Um, I think for me, like what I, what I could or would have changed if I, if I look back now is um, that application process did seem a little bit rough. Um, for those that are applying, I would really recommend doing your research, um, kind of seeing what options you have out there. Um, for the most part, I was kind of limited in what I could apply to because the deadlines were really, really fast approaching. Um, I was still going through that last semester for me. Um, so I'd really recommend reaching out to, to mentors, um, maybe some graduates who have also been through those programs. They have a lot of insight. 
um, and what the program's like, what to expect, and also maybe doing some research on uh, what classes are offered, because I know um, there's a lot of, like, for example, I'm in um, a higher education degree. I know there's a lot of higher education programs um, in the area, so kind of looking at what what specific classes they focus on. So like maybe do some, some, um, do some programs focus more on assessment, do some programs more focus more on like student population. So looking at things like that, but really reaching out and leaning on your mentors to see what, um, what they really recommend and highlighting their experiences and things, what would they change or what would they do if they could go back and do it now? I think that's super important. Um, as far as the last question, I would really recommend um, kind of, trying to get those experiences while you're doing your undergrad experience, if you can, um, just because when you're doing like your graduate interviews, um, a lot of those reflections and bringing up those experiences in your interviews is really helpful um, for your panel of um, whoever's doing the interviews at the time for your graduate program. Awesome, thank you, Gabriel. Um, so can we hear from uh, Daniela, please? So yeah, so I did actually, after graduation from here at eight, um, at Cap Poly in May 2021, I actually went to grad school directly. The process was really hard because the program I, I'm in now, I got rejected in May, last year, but the same day I got rejected, I reapplied in because like, I like to take risks in like the program. Like they had like a lot of options, like the stipend, especially like what's helping out like scholarship because um, definitely I would recommend to do your research when you apply for grad school because there are also scholarship and stipend that um, applies to internships that pays for your schooling as well. So that's what I definitely recommend. And looking back to the decision, I will still make the same decision now. And I will recommend to definitely do your research um, to see their stipends um, or any scholarship that offer during the program that you want to apply in. Thank you, Daniela. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next question. Um, so let me start. Imposter syndrome is defined as a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. So first-generation graduate students often experience this and may feel that they aren't as smart as their peers or that others will think they don't belong. Please describe your experience with the imposter syndrome and how you have managed or overcome it. Imposter syndrome is going to follow you anywhere, everywhere and anywhere you go. Um, I think it was something that I experienced very early on, like instantly in the first class. I sat there and I looked around and everyone was sharing like what they were working on and what their roles were and, you know, why they got into graduate school and you're sitting there and like even hearing all of them talk right now, you know, like I haven't presented at a conference and I haven't done any particular type of research right but I think it's it's constantly like my experience with it was like comparing myself to others or just thinking that I wasn't smart enough. Um, that was like my experience with imposter syndrome. I was always like, oh my God, like they're going to know that I don't know this theory or that I don't know how to do this. But genuinely my, my advice with imposter syndrome is you are in your graduate program to learn. That is what you are spending all that time and money on. So genuinely you're going to get out of it, what you put into it. So for me, it was more about, you know, being able to getting comfortable with with holding space and conversations, you know, and, and being critical and learning how to be critical was super important for me when I started grad school, because sometimes, you know, in, in undergrad or in K through 12, you're not really taught how to, you know, question like authors and I was literally in a class where I had to like be critical about a paper that my professor had written and I was terrified to like grade his paper in a sense and he was like no like this is what it's about you know like you have to be able to add stuff and change stuff and learn stuff so I think with me it was just telling myself like I was worthy of being there you know my my cohort my program in general is extremely competitive to get into so that was already like wow like why me why am I here how did I get here um, but challenging myself to to genuinely learn, um, holding space around my classmates and feeling like I'm worthy enough to be around them. I think another one, my mom has this saying that it's um, el sol sale para todos, which translates as like the sun shines for everyone. 
And I think like in your graduate program, although you're comparing yourself, you have to be happy for those around you. You know, you have to share that happiness. If someone gets a job or an internship or their research to prove or their thesis, you know, they get selected for thesis. Like these are people that you are going to see everywhere and you never know how they're going to help you or how you're going to help them. So I think another way of overcoming it was genuinely just being happy in the people that were around me, you know, and asking for help and not feeling like I wasn't smart enough in that process. And, and also, it's it's a process you know like i said when i first started talking i'm there i was there to learn i would but i was also there to get to know myself at a professional capacity so in that process not being so self-critical on myself and just being like hey you know like i'm getting to know myself i'm getting to know who i am and what i have to bring to the table um because graduate school at least with my program, there's two aspects to it, and you can either do the administrative route or you can do the counseling route. But through all of those classes that we take, you are getting to know yourself. You have to do a lot of self-reflection. You have to do a lot of um, exploration on who you are and who you want to be on your identities. Um, so being comfortable in, in almost like analyzing yourself too, that was also how I had to like, how I gained my confidence. Um, and I believe that's it, but it's super real. And, and you're not alone through that process. Everyone's feeling some sort of way about it. So just talk to your people and be happy for them and, and challenge yourself to take up space and be present is my advice. Thank you for sharing with us, Yadira, Gabriel. Yeah, I should go next. Thank you for this question. Um, I think for me, this is something like I've dealt with heavy throughout my program, and they kind of still deal with it as an early professional. Um, I remember my first day of class coming in, coming into class and just seeing all these amazing people who have done like all these amazing things, and it's really hard not to compare yourself to them. Um, I think for me, um, one of the things that I really try to um, kind of reflect on is I was, I believe like I was chosen for a reason. Um, if I'm here, like I'm in this space to learn and also like my intention, right? So for me, like I'm here in this position because I wanna help students get through um, some of the things that I've been through and, and mentor them and through that process. So I really try to reflect on that. And I uh, remember that I may not have all the answers, but like I'm doing my best. And um, like my, my overall goal is I wanna help students. So I think for me, those are some of the things that I've had to deal with, um, like even now as a professional. Um, one of the things that also helped me is having those conversations with with also my peers and other cohort mates. Um, you know, you may see a student and be like, wow, like they're a great, they're a great practitioner. Um, they have their themselves like so together, but when you have a conversation with them, you, you know, like, you know, they're, they're struggling to get through it too. Um, so really just opening uh, those conversation and having those um, like candid conversations with your cohort mates. Um, a lot of the times they are also going through that imposter syndrome, but um, really just try to remember you, you belong in a space you're chosen for a reason. Um, and try not to forget that I think in the definition is fear of being exposed as a fraud. But um, to me, I feel like, you know, I'm already occupying these spaces. Um, remember that, you know, remember why, like the intentionality behind what you're doing. Um, and always try to just, um, it's really a big a mind game. So really trying to get past that, um, remembering why you're in the program um, and focusing on your own strengths. I think that can really help you get past it. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, Sarah, can we hear from you next? Yes, um, thank you for this question. I would describe 2021 for me as the year of me becoming aware of imposter syndrome. I actually found out about it about 10 months ago when I started with the McNair Scholars Program. We had about an hour in-depth conversation about what imposter syndrome is and just different feelings that people um, experience because of it. And I realized, I was like, oh my gosh, I've had imposter syndrome <laughs> for most of my life. Um, and it wasn't until the summertime when I started working on my research project and we had to do you know, certain assignments like we had to write an abstract which is kind of like a summary of your research and I think the limit the word limit was 150 words and I spent oh my god I think the whole I spent multiple days on these like 150 words and it was never enough like it was never perfect and 
I, that's how I would feel. I felt like um, I was never good enough. And so it got to a point where I just kind of woke up and said, oh my gosh, where do, where is this coming from? And um, it really took me into like a deep self-reflection of these false beliefs I have that are associated with imposter syndrome. And um, so how I overcame it is I, now that I'm aware of it, I, I bounce back more quickly. Like I can identify that that's a false belief. Like I am good enough. And so um, like others have shared, I feel like imposter syndrome is something that maybe we'll have our entire life. But as we become more aware of it and talk more about it, we can find uh, tips, you know, techniques or strategies to bounce back quicker and talk back to that imposter syndrome voice. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, um, you guys all shared some very helpful tips on just overcoming um, imposter syndrome as students. I'd like to move on to our next question. Uh, Daniela, I know previously you had mentioned um, uh, some financial aid information such as stipends. So I'd like to uh, ask you this question. So what recommendations do you have for financing a graduate education? So definitely my recommendation is that when you apply to grad school, definitely like look into the program. If they apply, um, if they have any like scholarship because I came up with a mindset that grad school, like you don't get no scholarship, but you do actually, it just depends the school they apply to. And they also have a stipend. So the stipend means that you get money paid for your internship. Um, so whatever you get your higher the internship, you get your stipend. So every stipend you get paid it monthly. So it just depends on the program that you apply, but there is also outside scholarship. There's like the Hispanic Fund Scholarship. There's also like multiple call scholarship. If you go to the career counselor, like presented here at Cal Poly Pomona, they offer many scholarship for grad school. Awesome. And Sada, I know you're in the process of figuring it, everything out, uh, just tying it all together. So can you please share about this? Yes. So um, one of the reasons a couple years ago when I was like, oh, I'm going to get my PhD and then I saw how expensive it was, I said, OK, how am I going to do this? <laughs> uh, it's a lot of money. Um, but it actually it wasn't until when I got accepted to the McNair Scholars Program that I learned that there is funding available um, and especially for PhD programs. And so right now I'm currently in the process of like um, negotiating and working through funding. And my first acceptance letter, they waived the tuition. So for the PhD program, so I don't have to pay tuition. And then um, I was able to get a, a, it's called a research assistantship. So they pay you, um, you know, a, a set amount every month for your, you can cut, use that for like housing expenses, food. And also I reached out to the programs that I was applying and I asked like, um, is there fund additional funding? And it depends on the program. So one one of the programs I applied to, they said, don't worry about it. We take care of it. We will award the fellowships, scholarships, grants. You don't have to apply, do an application. There was another program that actually lets um, students that um, are entering the program to apply for scholarships. And it was one of the easiest scholarship applications um, that I did. There are a lot of fellowship and grants um, that the applications are due the October or like the fall season before grad school applications are due. So to make sure that as you're researching grad school programs to research those um, funding opportunities as well. That's very helpful. Um, and moving on to our very last question, uh, what skills did you develop in undergrad that helped have helped you succeed in graduate school? And how does the coursework differ from undergrad to grad school? So we can start with Yavita. Um, I think for me, my undergrad experience was very different than my graduate experience um, in the sense where like I have put my heart and soul into this graduate program. So I was definitely much more like disciplined and well organized. Um, I think during undergrad, like I quickly learned that the material that I was learning, I would have to learn how to apply it and actually practice it. So it's something that I'm seeing now in my graduate program, right? Like being strategic about what I'm learning and not so much learning the content, but learning how to use the content. Um, that is like super important when, for when, when you go to graduate school. Um, so I guess like tangible skills would be like 
staying organized, like creating a folder of every week of all my readings, all of my assignments, making sure that, you know, I'm aware of what's coming up. I use my Outlook calendar for everything. So that would be like another skill. Um, with reading skills and like comprehending like the, the subject matter that I'm learning, um, I have ter a terrible attention span and I know I do. So at times I time myself, like I'll sit down for 20 minutes uninterrupted. And um, after like that 20 minutes goes by, I then proceed to like, okay, take a five minute break and kind of just like learn little things and, and tricks. I guess like my biggest advice is like, getting to, to know yourself and like what you need in the process. And that's okay if you don't know going into grad school. Um, how does coursework differ? I kind of touched on this. Um, a lot of the time you're learning coursework that you have to apply, that you have to have the knowledge on to kind of like move forward. Um, so it could be very like textbook heavy and a lot of reading, a lot of essays, a lot of papers. That is true. You're never going to stop writing. Um, so I think that that's how it differs the, the most from my undergraduate experience. Thank you for sharing, Yadida. Uh, moving on to Seth. So some uh, skills that I've uh, developed in my undergrad is, that, like I mentioned before, research skills, just learning like the research process. Um, there's a lot of steps. And then also, I don't know if this is considered like a skill, but like confidence, um, just, and also being um, aware of your environment, which is why I, in the earlier I mentioned, like um, the first times I heard PhD, it was, uh, it wasn't, um, what's it called? I felt like it wasn't possible for me in the beginning because I didn't see a female, someone like me who had a PhD. And it wasn't really until I saw someone uh, like me, which was Lorena, I was like, oh, it's possible. So being aware of what the images and and the, the people around you, like what are you absorbing? Um, I don't know how if there's a one word for that type of skill, but um, being like self aware, um, yeah, being confident, uh, time management, uh, organizational skills, um, yeah, those all have helped me so far. Okay, so we will be shifting gears. Uh... We'll be quickly moving on to a Q&A session in case you have any questions you would like to ask of our panelists. But before then, uh, for our closing remarks, we would like for the panelists to leave us with one line of advice that they have for um, us attendees. So uh, we can start with Daniela. Please be confident on yourself, never doubt yourself, and also setting boundaries because grad school definitely taught me to set boundaries on myself and always priority yourself. Thank you. Um, Gabriel? I would say um, believe in yourself, enjoy your journey, and trust your process. Uh, Sara? So my advice is that you can do it. You, you can go to grad school. And another piece of advice, I know it's only one, <laughs> but um, to make sure that um, to be aware of like what's your intention of going to grad school and that it aligns with your values and your purpose because that will help you um, throughout the process because it's you know challenging but just uh, being aware of that I think can really help you when times get tough. Awesome. And last but not least, uh, Yadira. Um, I think I'm just going to I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, my first piece of advice is genuinely to do your research into the program that you're interested in. Connect with any of us here today if you have any questions, um, you know, like blunt, like transparent questions, we will answer. And then lastly, um, build your support system, include your family, whether they know or don't know, they are literally going to get you through grad school in the most subtle way possible. So really just include your family if it's important to you or build a support system that's never, they're not going to let you down in that process. Um, they love to hear you talk about it. Thank you. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists for giving their time uh, to us today. Um, and in addition to our Q&A, we will also have a reflection, uh, yeah, it's like a reflection uh, piece to complete 
uh, the link will be provided on the Zoom chat uh, by Denise. So for our attendees, if you could please uh, click on that link and complete that. But we are opening it up to a Q&A. So anybody, uh, if you have questions, feel free to speak up. Uh, I want to mention a question that was in the chat. We have um, Julie and Alejandro asked, where can I find the grad school advisor at Cal Poly? Um, Sara and Daniela both shared that they went to the Career Center for grad school advice and they spoke to professors in their department. Do you all have any other suggestions or tips or anything else uh, for that question? I think Laura just posted it, but the grad studies office, every campus has a graduate studies office. And I had, for example, a cohort mate who went to like the Long Beach one and they helped her like do the entire application and prepare, prepare her for the interview process and everything because you have to interview for graduate school. Um, so graduate offices on any campus that you're applying to should be able to assist you. Just say you're a prospective student. Cool. Dustin also shared a link to the Grad Resource Center. Um, I had a question about um, working and going to grad school. I know some of you may be working full time like Yadira and balancing your grad program. Some of you may be um, working part time or um, like Daniela, I think you're like doing like a grad assistantship or internship. So how you balance that, what advice or suggestions or tips or struggles um, that students can anticipate with that. Well, for me, um, it's definitely time management because where I was talking about boundaries, uh, one of our, our professors, my professor told us about boundaries, like never feel guilty saying no to things because grad school would definitely, it's a lot of work, a lot of essays. Um, that's definitely one thing is just setting boundaries because like I have a hard time saying boundaries, saying like, no, I will say yes to everything, but it's always to say, to not feel guilty saying no and just, just like priority yourself and just time management. It's not easy doing um, assistantship in school at the same time, it's not easy. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll echo what Daniela shared. Um, I work full time and do grad school full time, um, but I was very strategic with my employment. I think everyone in my office is extremely supportive of the role that I'm in and they know that I'm a graduate student. Um, I, I work at Cal Poly Pomona and it's not just so much the office, it's the campus. Like everyone always, always like, how's school going? Um, so I think that's helpful. I think another thing, like she shared boundaries and I, earlier I shared my Outlook calendar, make time to have social time. You know, you're not just a graduate student. I know that that's a really big identity as you're going through the process. But for me, it was like, if I was just a graduate student, like I tried to be the first year. Um, I wasn't staying true to myself. I wasn't taking care of my relationships. I wasn't having family time. So, you know, literally on my calendar, I set time with friends and I send them invites and I'm like, hey, we're hanging out this weekend. And, you know, I let my family know everything that I'm doing so that they don't feel like put off to the side. Um, so that helps being organized and strategic in what you're planning in. Um, being aware of the work environment that you're in and hopefully like having that conversation ahead of time with your employers and letting them know that, hey, you know, like this is what I'm doing right now. Is this some way that, you know, like, is there some way that you can support me? Um, I have this conversation all the time. I, I can jump in. So I think kind of going off of what my, my peers said, um, I would say definitely set boundaries. Um, obviously we're not just graduate students, so making sure that you're taking that time for yourself. Um, I think for me, like working full-time, I work two part-time jobs, but it's a little bit harder. I work here at Cal Poly and also at Mount Sac. Um, so really leaning on a study group. Um, in grad school, you could get like, at least for my program, I get like anywhere from like 300 to 400 pages a week. Um, and it's like unrealistic for us to read all through that by ourselves. So really being strategic about 
you know what material you're focusing on, um, what material you're gonna you're gonna rely, uh, rely on your uh, your study group to really kind of give you that insight. Um, so really making sure you're being strategic about what material you want to really um, digest and um, kind of sit with for a while and think about, um, as well as you know continuing to do all the other um, responsibilities you have as far as work and also um, your assignments and things like that. So really leaning on your cohort mates and your study group if you can. Great, thank you. And we also have another question in the chat uh, from Abigail. Where can I find research opportunities on campus? Um, Sara, I think you've mentioned uh, doing research, connecting with professors. Would you be able to answer Abigail's question? Yeah, so uh, when I uh, needed a faculty mentor for, uh, for the McNair Scholars Program to do my research project, I reached out to, and I think it was mentioned earlier, the Grad Studies Department of, of the Nutrition Department or College of Agriculture. And I emailed the director and I said, I wanna do research, but I need help connecting with a faculty mentor. And I was able to um, communicate with a professor who could be my mentor and, and I could do research. I also, before that time, I emailed professors to ask them, do you have any research studies that you need us, um, assistance for? And I was able to get one and it was virtual and I got experience, it was paid. And also the Project Hatchery program, if you have an idea of a for a research project, they help you from the very first phase of, you know, um, that's why it's called Hatchery, because it's like your idea is in an egg and then it hatches, <laughs> that's their little icon. So if you have your own ideas of but for doing a research study, you can get funded through the Projects Hatchery program. And that's in the Office of uh, uh, Undergraduate Research. Cool, thank you. Um, and in the chat, Laura also added the Office of Undergraduate Research and Christian added the link. Uh, OUR has a scholarship for students who are doing research. So even if you're a grad student or on campus at Cal Poly, or if you're an undergrad, even though it says Office of Undergraduate Research, they can help you with um, expenses if you wanna present your research, like if you want to travel, go to a conference, if you need to pay fees to present, or even like fees for travel, for hotel, um, they have scholarship opportunities available. And it's a really great way to build your resume, build your CV, get your experience if you're thinking of going to grad school or if you're in grad school. Uh, there are also peer mentoring workshops about research opportunities too, and RAMP has um, offered that in the past, so we'll be happy to connect you with that. Great questions, keep them coming. Any other questions that y'all have for our panelists? If no one has a question, I wanted to ask, um, as first generation college students, a lot of times our families don't um, quite understand what it means to get uh, a graduate degree. They're a little confused sometimes, like, wait a minute, didn't I just go to your graduation? So if any of you guys wanna share what that experience might've been for you in educating your family um, as to why you need more education and what you're doing, and why you might be going out of state, for instance. I can start. I'm actually going through some of that right now. My family, uh, well, I'm the first one to, to go to grad school and my, my family doesn't really understand the, the, everything from the application, what grad school is. Um, they're still like, wait, are you going to be a medical doctor? Like, what is a PhD? And <laughs> so, what I've been doing is, I kind, I've, I, I've been, I've been doing my best to kind of bring them into my world. So, like, for example, I presented at RISCA on Saturday, and I have a YouTube recording of my presentation. So, I shared it with them, so they know what my research is about. Um, I've been communicating with them, like, oh, I might go to this state, and um, this is what I'll be doing. This is a type of research, and so kind of just sharing with them like involving them throughout the process and also spending a lot of time with them because I will be moving out of state um but it's a lot of conversations that's how I've been uh 
going through this experience as, as a first gen student is really talking and feeling my emotions because it's sad um, and it's a little scary, you know, but also exciting. It's an adventure. So just being very honest and with them. Yeah, um, I think Sarah already said it nicely. It's hard. It's hard when not only is there new topics of conversation um, at the table, but there's new language right around like what you're doing and your family might not be aware you know i think lucky for me i i had an older sister who stepped into like the college world before me but i am the first one to go to a master's program so even though she relates there's also still just like a disconnect and even though my mom i i've always said this she might not know what i'm doing but you know she makes my oatmeal every morning and she makes sure that i do, that i don't starve you know like your family is going to be there for you in ways. And that's why I said earlier, like include them because they are going to be there for you if you ask for help. Um, and if it's not them, then it's your cohort mates that you're including and you're asking for help. Um, but I think for me, it's just like Sara said, talking about it and telling them like, oh, I had this as, as opposed to then just being like, how was your day? And you're like, oh, it was good. Just be like, oh, it was good. Like I met with my professor and we had office hours and they're probably going to be like, I have no idea what you're saying, but it's going to be familiar to them little by little, like actually giving them a breakdown of what your day looks like. Um, and as I'm talking, I'm like, wow, I, I need to talk to my mom about this project that I'm working on. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's conversations like that, that it's not just a new process, but it's new language to them that, that they don't know. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, I do want to be aware of time. I know that some of you may have a class or another commitment. Daniela included her email in the chat if you want to ask her additional questions about grad school. You can also email us at ramp at cpp.edu, which I'll type into the chat. And uh, some more of our panelists are sharing their emails. So I want to thank our panelists for sharing your stories and being vulnerable and sharing your experiences so that our students who are first gen can also um, get an understanding and start being introduced to graduate school. If we can um, get a thumbs up or a clapping emoji for our panelists, thank you so much for sharing your time and being with us today. Um, if you all can please complete our reflection. I've typed that link into the chat and that just helps us really provide workshops that uh, you will benefit from. So what you want to see, uh, what you thought helped you the most, if there's anything that else that you would want us to include in this panel um, so we can tailor it to what your needs are. And if we can get a picture for social media, we are at CPP Ramp on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Caitlin's our um, communications coordinator, so I'll hand it off to you. All right, everyone, um, if you are willing and able to uh, turn on your camera so we could take a, a quick photo. Um, all right, so I'm going to take a couple. <laughs> 